Well, welcome everybody to a special midweek slash end of the week edition of the Drive and Dish NBA podcast. My name is Kevin Rafuse. My co-host, Justin Kuzart, is off for the weekend. He is gallivanting in Boone, North Carolina. I will let you figure out where that is on a map or if you know you happen to live there, say what's up to Justin. He'll be up all weekend. But joining me tonight, co-hosting the podcast, is a very special guest. If you've been listening to this podcast for a long time, you are already familiar with this man, Mr. Tim Tompkins, former co-host of this very podcast, current host of the Solar Panel podcast, which is all about the Phoenix Suns. Follow him on Twitter at Radio Tim NBA. And uh, Tim, there's only one way to start this, man. Does the ball lie? <laughs> yes. Yes, the ball lies a lot. I was going to say, I, I felt like there was a really uh, complicated, long answer coming here. but uh... It's weird, man. It's it's weird to be back on the solar panel. And also, I, I can't help but wonder, because I think I've been gone for like, what, two years now? Yeah, it's two years about. Because uh, it was, yeah, end of 2017. So almost, almost two years. Right. So how many of your listeners even... Uh, are are from back there as opposed to all the new ones that you've garnered throughout yeah. the entire process? Well, it's interesting because when you left, obviously a, a decent portion of the Phoenix contingent left, and I'm hoping the Phoenix contingent comes back for this one since we're going to talk a lot of Suns. <laughs> but, you know, so we've had, you know, it's interesting because we have the, the new wave of people who only know it as me and Justin, and then obviously we still have the, the day ones who, you know, have thankfully stuck around for – you know, both versions of the podcast. And you've been back once since then. Uh, we recorded an episode, what, I guess, I guess that was a little over a year ago now. Um, but yeah, it's kind of crazy, though. I did, I stumbled upon a comment on Reddit the other day, um, which, you know, usually I don't read the Reddit comments because that can be a bit of a death trap. <laughs> uh, but it was funny. It was talking about NBA podcasts and it had mentioned us. And, it's, and it was one listener who had to be an older listener. I, I forget who this was or I'd shout you out. Um, but they said, yeah, you know, it was funny. I thought the podcast was going to take a hit when Tim left and it did, but it kind of created or it almost became like a different show. So I don't know, whatever works as long as people are still listening. You know, uh, I spent some time listening to it after, and I still do listen to most of the episodes. Mm -hmm. Um, I enjoyed it better without myself on it. I thought Justin just did a better job. Well, it's funny because, like, I mean, it's... it's and don't it's agree too much. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not agreeing too much because my favorite episodes to listen to back in the day when it was the three of us would be the ones with you and Tim and Justin. Or, or it was just you and Justin, I should say. Um, I don't know. Like, I mean, but that's always with me in general, too. Like, I don't... Like, do you go back and listen to Solar Panel after you do it? Like, I only really listen to segments if I go after and record it because, you know, it's stuff like we lived it. So I, it's, you know, unless somebody's roasting me over a comment I made, I'm just kind of like, well, you know, we had it. No, but uh, on the same note, I, I edit the Solar Panel podcast, mm -hmm. so I'm already re-listening to it, and I'm not going to re-listen to it a third or a fourth oh, time, yeah. unless it's a really good episode. Yeah, I would. there would have to be some really great moment or like an all-time interview or, you know, something like that. But, you know, no, both both versions of the podcast are great. And, um, you know, like we said, uh, everything everything is moving along. Uh, Tim is here. We're going to talk a lot of Suns this episode, um, the Monty Williams hire. Uh, the State of the Suns Young Prospects. Also going to talk a little bit of Eastern Conference playoffs, too. Uh, give us a review on iTunes. We will be uh, reading them on the podcast. Um, shout out to our UK reviewer. We've got uh, that queued up for next week when Justin gets back. Uh, you know, we're on that quest to get to 200 reviews in America. Rate us on iTunes. Uh, we will read the good and the bad. Also, shout out to Lineups. Make sure you're checking out lineups.com, getting all your fantasy betting information. Conference finals are coming up. End of the second round if you want to get those last-minute wagers in. Also, you know, if you want to do some other sports, NHL playoffs, baseball is in full swing right now. It's always, again, at lineups.com. Check out the full Lineups podcast network as well. And now a word from our sponsors. All right, three, two, one. All right, so Tim is here. Uh, really, it's been, you know, it's kind of destiny that this is ahead of the draft lottery. And, you know, there will be a whole lot to talk about afterwards. But, you know, want to get some of that pre-talk in with Tim before the, uh, you know, before the ping pong balls were all fully decided. But before we get into that, um, you know, the, the Suns have been in the news recently. Really, first, it was the firing of Igor as the coach. And I think they got a lot of flack for that. But it's really interesting because I think as soon as the Suns hire Monty Williams, you know, if there was a coach who could be like, uh, well, maybe this isn't so dysfunctional after all. It's Monty, a guy who's you know pretty well respected across the league, has been a head coach before, you know, currently in a system with the Sixers right now. Um, you know, much has been made of his relationship with Kevin Durant, but really, you know, Monty Williams is one of those guys who, you know, he just garners game up. Uh, there's never really anyone that talks ill about him. 
so, you know, I'll ask you, it, it's been really a, a coaching carousel over here in the last five seasons. But, you know, are you thrilled with the Monty Williams hire? Do you feel like this is bringing the stability that the Suns need? Because, I mean, that's the thing from the outside looking in is that Suns need the most is stability. It has been an absolute roller coaster with this team uh, between coaching hires and, and trades and a lot of really crappy point guards and injuries uh, and a GM being fired and a new interim G- GM and then that GM being promoted. You know, I'm sure we'll get into the, the Jeff Bauer hire at some point. Um, but I think that a lot of Suns fans really liked Igor. I mean, the record speaks for itself for last mm. season. They weren't great. They had a lot of injury. That being said, the people that really watched the Suns closely saw that internal development with a lot of their younger players uh, throughout the year. And that was really what he was brought on to do was develop the younger guys. And it was hard to give Igor a hard time for the record when they didn't have a starting point guard, when they Mm. didn't have any uh, capable veterans on the roster, when the majority of their uh, entire roster was under 25, they were starting three rookies last season. So what do you really expect out of this coach? And I think everybody just really liked him. And it it was a bit of a shocker when he was fired. Um, I have talked to some people internally that uh, uh, are close to the Suns and close to the Suns players and um, not to cite anonymous players in it, but essentially a lot of what was being said about Igor was that, um, frankly, there was a bit of a language barrier. They had a hard time understanding him because of his really thick accent. They thought that um, he was more of an assistant coach than an actual head coach. Uh, one player did say that he's a good coach. It was just a tough situation. If I had to guess who that was, I think it was probably Jamal Crawford. It sounds like a veteran a veteran comment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But the Suns fan base felt exactly like you did, Kevin, and everybody looking in that the Igor firing was just another sign of this instability. And I think everybody's really happy with the Monty Williams hire for all the reasons that you pointed out. Uh, There are some like areas of of caution. I think that when he was uh, coaching the Pelicans that during those five seasons that they had the, the 29th, the 27th, the 28th slowest offenses in the NBA. Uh, they shot very few three-pointers, right? When three-pointers were really starting to, to uh, creep up in the league and it was becoming a three-point dominant uh, league. But all this rambling on, I think the fact that he got a five-year deal from Sarver is what people are mostly excited about because we're talking about players that are on their, their fourth coach in three years. Well, and that's the stability. I mean, especially with Booker, you know, when you talk about, you know, developing young talent, because I think we everyone knows that that's the stage that Phoenix is in right now is there is, you know, that's the crazy part is everyone's talks about the record in the last couple of years. But the one thing that I think the Suns have that other quote unquote bad teams don't is that there's the potential to get really good really quickly if everything, you know, develops and progresses and, and goes along the way it's supposed to. There, there's no doubt that there is talent on that roster. It's not like it's completely been stripped bare, like, say, you know, with the Knicks, for example. Um, but it'll be interesting, and, and that's really going to be, you know, the big test for James Jones right away. Um, you know, took over when Ryan McDonough was fired. Uh, he's officially been named uh, the full GM now for the Suns. Um, you know, obviously he's relatively new to this position. Uh, he was playing in the league not too long ago, uh, with Cleveland, you know, was a part of that last championship team, you know, now stepping into that executive role, kind of the way without he and Elton Brand really are, are the two examples of, of the two recent players who have stepped into this role. But, you know, having seen, you know, let's say half a season, three quarters of a season of James Jones, you know, going into the off season, how this is going, I guess, how would we grade James Jones's tenure so far? Is is there genuine faith in him going forward? Or are we happy with that direction? Uh, it depends on, on who you mean by we, I suppose. It's, it's, it's a bit of a, a split uh, fan base. I can tell you, Greg Esposito, my co-host over, over at the Sun Solar Panel, grades James Jones on a very tall curve. I'm going to share a little bit of a story with you, Kevin, and uh, let you know why I like James Jones. And this is uh, one of those intangible things. Mm-hmm. It is really hard to measure. And then we can go over some of the actual moves that he's made. But So I am in Phoenix, and um, I'm sitting right behind the Sun's bench. And James Jones is walking around to the, the people on the lower level, uh, giving them tickets, uh, showing them to their seat, shaking hands. And there was something about seeing a GM do that to the fan base and not going up to everybody, but having a couple of different people throughout to, to go and say, hi, thanks for coming. 
that I think just spoke to the character of James Jones. There was another time in which Josh Jackson missed an autograph signing in Phoenix and James Jones showed up and bought everybody that was there a uh, 12 pack of beer. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It, it's, it's a bummer for anyone who's not 21, but okay. Yeah, no. And, and so obviously you don't want to grade a GM based on those types of things. But I think that a part of the issue that the Suns have is they have had Robert Sarver as an owner. And I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about him. Everybody knows about yeah. Robert Sarver as an owner. It's uh, cliche at this point to ask you about him. Like he's a bad owner. We don't need to <laughs> like really tippy toe around it. The guy isn't a good owner. He's pretty right. trash. The McDonough goat story is incredible, though. That went under the radar in terms of just wild NBA stories. Yeah. Uh, and then Ryan McDonough, who I actually thought Ryan McDonough was a really good GM, uh, a pretty good GM. He had a plan he set out. He did it. Um, but he wasn't a people person. He didn't understand relationships when it when it came to to players and to agents. And that is something that James Jones genuinely understands. And I think having somebody like James Jones that uh, a free agent or um, a possible a, a player that you know could get traded but then would have to communicate to the team whether or not he'd even be willing to resign before they make that trade can say to themselves, I don't have to deal with Robert Sarver. Mm -hmm. I can deal with James Jones. And, and there's a certain amount of value in that that I think is really powerful for the Suns organization right now. Well, and it's just respect, too. I mean, you know, go back to when he was playing, the all the praise that Kevin Love gave to him when he was in Cleveland and how much of a, you know, mentor he was for him over the years. And, you know, added to the fact that he followed LeBron around and played a key role in that team, despite the fact that he wasn't gaining minutes. Like, you know, I, there's something to be said about him maybe not being the most experienced, but at the same time, like, emotional intelligence is important. Being able to relate to the fan base is important and being able to communicate with these guys. I mean, look, James Jones has a fistful of rings so, you know, th that can speak to the young guys, too, a lot of times more than, you know, say an executive, a normal executive can who maybe hasn't played before or who just, you know, doesn't have that clout the way James Jones did with actually being in the league. Um, you know, one of his underheralded moves and a move that I really liked last year was going out and getting Kelly Oubre. Like, I thought that was the, exactly the type of move that a, a franchise like the Sun should be moving. And, you know, Oubre came in and, and kind of brought this Valley Boys mentality. And it looks like, I mean, it felt to me last year that he was the first person who seemed genuinely excited to be there. Um, and, and kind of embraced it. And it really, you know, there's not much of a turning point when the Suns were, you know, had the record that they did last year. And, and look, we knew they weren't going to really rattle off a, a long series of wins. But at the same time, it, it felt like it almost became, you know, a little more respectable. It wasn't the, the 35 point blowouts. It wasn't the just, you know, oh, my God, we're turning this off by the, you know, midway through the third quarter type games. Um, you know, what what kind of impact has he had in a guy like Jamal Crawford, who's been, you know, we know what Jamal Crawford is, just that class act veteran. You know, what have they brought to the locker room? Do you think that that really has kind of set the tone going into this season? Uh, I mean, to to unpack all of that. So the the moves that James Jones has made, the, the very first move he made was to sign Jamal Crawford. At, I think it was the veterans minimum, mm -hmm. something along those lines. Uh, and the impact that Jamal Crawford had within that locker room all year long with all the players. I mean, everybody has spoken so highly of Jamal Crawford all year, not to mention that he was a fine backup point guard on a team that wasn't going to win any games anyway. Um, that was a really good move. The fact that he was able to trade an expiring Trevor Ariza for an up-and-coming wing in Kelly Oubre, who was a perfect fit for this team. Uh, he was able to trade Ryan Anderson, who could not play even on a bad Suns team, for Tyler Johnson. And, and you're th saying to yourself, Tyler Johnson isn't a great player. He's not, but he can play. <laughs> you know, he's he brings value. So you were able to do that. Uh, and then his very last move of the season, he signed Jimmer for dead. I think that was just to sell some tickets, honestly. So I don't even really want to talk about that one. <laughs> the the moves his that advanced stats were incredible. Not to, like Justin and I had a I think he was a fallen at one point. Um, and balling and fallen and Jimmer's just and again, small sample size. So you, you can't run yeah, off it. But trapped. it was oh, man, it was, it was beautiful. Uh, uh, he was not good. He was not. But it was the end of the season. It didn't matter. You know, um, but the, the the moves that he's made, uh, all of them were good. None of them set the franchise back. Uh, none of them hurt the roster. None of them hurt the culture. Every single one of those moves were really good. And then uh, there's comments coming out indirectly, if you will, through Robert Sarver today saying that if the Suns draft Morant, that they're still going to go out and they're going to get a veteran point guard and that he's going to come off the bench. 
And I, you know, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the draft, I'm sure. But these are the exact type of things that you want to hear from a GM and the exact type of moves you want to see with an interim GM. And I thought the Monty Williams hire, you know, they, that's it was only going to be OK for them to fire Igor if they could pull off something like Monty Williams from the Lakers for five years. He's made good moves. Yeah, well, and that's the thing. It's again, there's there's a plan, there's consistency. It just seems like they have, a, you know, it's not like let's just rip it up every year because it's not working immediately. And you know, things like this take time. It's gonna these guys have to develop, um, you know, real quick. Because I I want to get into a, a longer Devin Booker discussion, but I'll ask you first: okay. is the is Devin Booker good? The most annoying debate on NBA Twitter currently. Ah, oh, man. So we had Nate Duncan on our podcast because Nate Duncan and Danny LaRue, uh, they have to be among the most hated. Oh yeah. They hate Booker analysts, uh, from, from sons, uh, fans and they do, they hate Booker. And yeah. so we're talking about all these young players and they're saying things like offense really matters. And, and so, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, offense matters more than defense. So we're going to value certain players higher, but then they value Devin Booker below guys. I can't even remember off the top of my head who is below, but it was like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, Devin Booker, what did he average last season? Like 27, six and six. He's great. Devin yeah. Booker is a damn good player. He's on a crappy team. What yeah. do you want him to do? Well, it's the empty stats argument, and that's always what it is, is that is he an empty stats on a – on? but you know, people say he hasn't helped the team win yet, which I understand that, but it's also like look at the roster he's surrounded with. I mean, other than T.J. Warren and, and DeAndre Ayton, who on that team before Kelly Oubre are we looking at is can do – what type of difference are we expecting to make out here? Who's the secondary guy? I mean, they were and that's really – they were starting DeAnthony Melton. Yeah, and, well, and that's the crazy. I mean, it is kind of amazing that you guys didn't get a single point guard last year. Like, it's really a stat. I mean, even like God, Austin like Rivers was there, and Tyler Johnson is there, but Austin Rivers didn't end up staying. And then Tyler Johnson. I mean, like, I guess he's a point guard, but not really. Like, he's a shooting guard. Uh, so it was almost kind of incredible. But um, I mean, but going back to book, because I think that's replaced Jokic to me because now I think it's it's pretty universally accepted that Nikola Jokic is awesome at this point where you know two years ago it wasn't and that was constantly the debate is is Jokic good or not I feel like that's become the is Booker good or not it's almost like up there with the LeBron MJ thing in terms of annoyance but I guess now you know Booker did get the max money so you know look clearly a dynamic gifted offensive player um, can score with the best of anyone um, is exactly the type of player you want in today's modern game. He spaces the floor. Yes, there are defensive concerns, but you know it, it, I don't think it's anything worth jumping off the cliff about. Not when you're that gifted offensively. It, so I guess the question now, you know, having despite the inconsistent development, you know, we've seen a lot out of Devin Booker. You know, what what has impressed you the most? What do you think is I guess what do you think his ceiling is? Um, you know, t talk about his role in the team. What would you like to see out of him going forward in terms like what did Devin Booker need to do to get to the next level? Well, to your point, I think the only thing that's going to calm this is Devin Booker good debate is Devin Booker needs to win some damn games. Yeah. And at a certain point, uh, a max player wins games. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way it is. So he, he needs to win some games. Uh, as, as far as development goes, I mean, you want to say the defense, but you know, at the end of the day, he is a better defender than people give him credit for. Uh, I think a lot of his defensive issues are a bit overblown, and it's because people are watching the highlight highlights and different things like that. And that's there and actually watching the Suns games. He's not a plus defender uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but he is not, according to Nate Duncan and Danny LaRue, the best or, or the worst defensive guard in the NBA. You know, that could go to somebody like Lou Williams, for example. It, it, it's just, it's a dumb statement. Uh, I, I think for him, the, the biggest thing that we saw from him was definitely the playmaking this year, where when he was the starting point guard, he was averaging 9, 10, 11 assists. I think he had a couple of 12, 13 assist games at some point uh, throughout the season. Unfortunately, his hand was a bit hurt this season, so his three-point shooting wasn't as good as we would like to see. Uh, uh, where What would be nice to see from Devin Booker is in clutch situations, so you know within five points, three minutes left in the game. Uh, he has a usage rate of about 70%. And I think it would be nice if Devin Booker could learn to trust his teammates a little bit more in those situations. I think that that would make them closing out games not be quite so 
predictable, and that would be a big step forward. Um, and then if he is going to improve on his defense, his on-ball defense is fine. It's his off-ball defense that that could improve. There's times when you see players playing defense, one of the underrated things that you're looking for, too, is that even when they aren't the person that's covering the ball, they have their hands spread out, their arms spread out on the floor, and a lot of the times Devin Booker just doesn't. And I think picking up little habits like that will really go a long way with him. Well, and you talk about tr- trusting his teammates. I mean, the one teammate he's going to be paired with a lot and really whose growth is going to be tied is, is DeAndre Ayton, last year's number one pick. Um, you know, unfortunately, this season he dealt with a little bit of injuries in his own regard. Um, it felt like every time he was rolling, there'd be something. Um, but still, overall, I mean, the reality is, is he was pretty productive and he was on the floor. Um, you know, looks like he has that offensive game he was built to be. Definitely a little defensive concerns, but I don't think it's anything that could be worked on. But, you know, injuries aside, what were your year one impressions of Aiden? He improved dramatically on the defensive end throughout the year. Uh, and that's something that went largely unnoticed because by the end of the year, again, nobody was really watching the damn Suns. Yeah. And I don't blame them. Uh, it was hard to watch uh, for certain points of it myself, but uh, I love the team. And, uh, you know, we have the Sun Solar Panel podcast, so I had to. Aiton was good. Uh, he was everything that I thought he would be coming out of college. And I think if you like Aiton or you don't like Aiton, that statement holds true. Well, I think he had the thing with Aiton was you knew what his floor was and his floor was really high. And when your floor is that high, it's like, well, if we're, if, if he doesn't develop at all remotely, you're going to have a pretty gifted offensive center who is a little bit of a liability on the defensive end. But still, like his floor is a really, really good center. And, you know, like you said, as that goes on, I mean, do you think it how much of it do you think is his motor? Because I felt like almost it, it seemed like he was a little lackadaisical on the defensive end. And it just feels like even with as he gets more into NBA shape and, you know, isn't dealing with the injuries and is playing more and more minutes, it feels like that'll come. No. Yeah, that, that was a big issue. I mean, there were definitely certain points in which Igor could not play Aiden for very long stretches of games. So we saw, saw a lot of Rashawn Holmes. Yeah. Aiden would be the perfect player if he had Rashawn Holmes motor in his body. Yeah. That being said, his true shooting percentage uh, some somewhere around 59%, which is the highest for an NBA uh, uh, rookie uh, NBA center in history above Shaq and all those guys. I think he averaged somewhere around like 17 and 12. Like he was, he was very good. The issue is always going to be Aiton was good. Did you want to take a number one pick as a center in today's NBA when you had Luka Doncic sitting right oh, yeah. there? Yeah, no, I, I know. I didn't really want to bring that up. And you were pro Luca for what it was worth. Like I remember, I'm pro. I'm, I'm, I think Aiden's great, but you can find offensive-minded centers in the NBA a lot easier than you can find guys like Luka Doncic. Even well, and- Young had a, made an argument uh, to be rookie of the year. Yeah. yeah, well, and that's the thing is that too, you know. Do you think DeAndre Ayton is going to be or I, I guess the question and the logic is if you're going one is or if you want to take an offensive gifted center or one is, you know, is it an Embiid? Is it a Jokic? Is it a Carl Anthony Towns type prospect where they are just that gifted and it is worth it to build inside and out? You know, that depends on your opinion of Ayton. I mean, I agree with you at the time. We were on the same page. You know, I, I know a lot of people because I think Dave and Espo were both pro Ayton, but I know you and I were both pro Doncic. Also, I think a lot of that has to do with the the fact that the Suns have not had a gifted center in so very long that just yeah. the of having one. And look, Ayton was good. He improved dramatically on the defensive end. Uh, from the start of the year to the end of the year in any of, you know, Zach Lowe agrees on this point because he's watching a lot of basketball. And uh, it's just a fact. And if he can make those same kinds of incremental improvements again next year and the year after, and to your point, if he can get his conditioning up, because it's much different going from college playing a few games, to the NBA where you're playing 82. And honestly, uh, it's been so long since the Suns have had a, a really great center that I forgot how many damn good centers there are on the NBA until I <laughs> eight and go up against every single one of them. Yeah, well, and it feels like there's a lot more. I mean, I mentioned, I mean, to me, the top level is, is the guys I mentioned, Embiid, Jokic, Towns. I think you could argue Gobert is there strictly off his defensive prowess as well, Anthony Davis. Um, but, I mean, even those, those second-tier guys, guys like Andre Drummond, um, even an, even another rookie prospect like Jaron Jackson, who I, yeah. who I think you know could be like Aiton as well. Um, but I mean, yeah, that's the thing is it was never going to be a bad pick with Aiton, which is I think the one thing that the Suns were going for too, is because there's been, you know, I mean that, that's really been the other thing with the Suns is just kind of not hitting on draft picks. You know, whether it's a Dragon Bender 
uh, whether it's a Josh Jackson. You know, what's up with Josh Jackson? Because I was, I mean, I was super high on Josh Jackson. Like, I remember texting you when you drafted Josh Jackson going, yo, this kid is a stud. I'm all in. He's going to be an elite defender. If he develops any remotely bit of an offensive game, I thought he was going to be a stud for years. Uh, it just hasn't really developed like that. I mean, there's been a, a couple of flashes, but I mean, not nearly what we expected out of the number four billing. I mean, you know, what, what's up with Josh Jackson? Like, what hasn't worked here? Uh, his playing basketball, he, he plays, <laughs> he, he plays basketball. Like I play pickup, um, uh, and taking really terrible, uh, angled shots at the rim. He misses dunks. He's a good player at, at the end of every single season so far. And we've only had two, uh, all of a sudden his true shooting percentage goes up and he averages 20 plus points a game, a couple of assists, a couple of steals. He looks like a good defensive player. Then the summer comes, then he plays the summer league. Everyone's like, what the hell is happening? It's just because he's summer league. Uh, Josh Jackson right now, and then the season starts and he's trash. Um, uh, so I, I don't think anyone really knows. Uh, what we do know is that the Suns are have pretty much decided uh, that they are going to trade TJ Warren this summer. That is going to happen. And there's a very, very good likelihood that Josh Jackson is going to be um, included in some deal that brings a player back. Don't forget, we haven't even talked about Mikael Bridges yet, uh, who Suns fans are incredibly high on. He's a very, very good prospect, very, very good player. Um, but between Oubre and uh, Mikael Bridges, I just don't think that there's a lot of room for Josh Jackson. Oh, yeah. Ubre's are Ubre's already developed and you know Bridges I think showed it last year. I just think, you know, Br- Bridges is a perfect prototype for today's NBA. He can shoot the three and he can defend and I just think there's a bit more upside there with Josh Jackson. It's unfortunate. Like I I you know, I hope the kid pans out. I just I agree with you. I don't think it's going to happen in Phoenix. Um, you know, what type of return do you think they'll get for TJ Warren? I don't know. I mean, it it, it depends. TJ Warren's a really good player. Uh he, he's a guy that's going to uh, shoot around 48, 49% from the field, uh, which is really good for his position. You get 20 points a game in limited minutes uh, and can make uh, a good team. He could he could make, he could be a starter on a decent team and he could be the sixth man on a good team. And I think that there's a lot of value in that. And thankfully there is positional scarcity in the NBA. So you have to wonder what other GMs are thinking uh, he shot around 40% this year from three on a, a very, very high volume. Uh, so him being able to stretch the floor really does help. Still limited defensively. He can't switch, and that's uh, a big issue with his game. Uh, he's not a willing passer. I don't think I've ever seen him pass the ball uh, once, uh, which is fine because he can score. You know, uh, He's also not a very good rebounder for his size, so it, I'm not sure the type of player that that really gets back. But if you throw in a young prospect where they can say, look, Josh Jackson's had three coaches in two seasons. He was on the Phoenix Suns. We think we can do something with him. Uh, maybe they can get something back. You know, name recognition matters and the fact that he was drafted so high. I mean, you know, that'll get you one or two maybe extra years that you wouldn't have if you were somebody lower. So it'll be interesting there. Um, I'm also praying for you internally. I know T.J. Warren is your boy, so that's going to be it's going to be a tough day in Tim Tompkins land when he leaves. It's so sad. I do love me some T.J. Warren. Uh, Kelly Oubre, though, is the player that Suns fans wanted Josh Jackson to be. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. I, I still like Oubre a lot. Like I said, I, I thought that was a really savvy move by James Jones. Probably my favorite of his so far. Um, let's talk draft. Uh, so Phoenix is obviously going to have a top three pick. Um, hopefully well, for their seven. sake. Yeah, well, yeah. But well, I, we let's assume it's going to be around top three. Four, <laughs> worst case scenario. I hope I didn't just jinx you all. Um, there's no way they won't draft Zion if they get one, right? Like, it, it will be Zion. They won't overthink this and get weird. Tim, don't, don't give me that look. That's not good. I don't know. I don't know. I heard a lot of rumblings that they really like Morant. Uh, they get to decide what they're going to do. I can uh, tell you with almost certainty, it's very likely that if they do not get a uh, top two pick, that that pick is gone. I don't yeah, know. I could... They're not interested in adding uh, more rookies to this roster. Yeah, and I can understand that. I mean, Moran is a no-brainer if you're the Suns. To me, I mean, obviously, the obvious statement is that the Phoenix Suns need a point guard. Uh, and, you know, John Moran is that. I mean, I just think he's ex- he's super explosive. I really liked his game in college. Like, to me, he's the second best player in this draft, regardless of need. Um, and, yeah, of course, I think he fits better in terms of Phoenix than Zion. But, you know, Zion is such a gifted prospect that I just don't think you overthink it. And, you know, you can get an NBA point guard, I guess is I my mean- point. I agree with you, but at the on the same token, it's not us making that decision. Right. No, I, I hear you. Um, I still think, 
I mean, you could talk me into a trade back too at one. If you really are just that sold on Morant, I mean, teams will give you the farm to draft Zion. I mean, this dude is the most hyped prospect since. I mean, I don't know. It feels cliche to say LeBron, but I mean, he's one of the more hyped number ones in, in quite a bit. I'll say at least since Anthony Davis, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, so you could probably fleece somebody, but I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like if Phoenix gets one, it's going to be Zion. But I also think, of course, the lottery could be rigged for New York, too. So I'm right. kidding. The lottery's really not rigged. But uh, but Morant, though, I mean, I, I do think John Morant, That's a, and that's the beauty of the situation that you guys are in right now with Phoenix is that Phoenix getting the two-pick is not really the end of the world here. Like, John Moran is a great fit immediately on that roster. Yeah, we want the number one pick, though. Yeah, of course. I mean, you got to draft Zion. Like, <laughs> the, the dude is just... A guy that big shouldn't be able to move like that. Like, he's like a dancing bear. He just gets to his spot so well. And the guy, like, he's he'll remind me... I, I feel like he'll have a little bit of the issue that Embiid and Giannis have had in that they're just so damn big that they just plow these people over sometimes and, and you know, are liable or prone to offensive fouls because they're just so much bigger than everyone. And, you know, you start using that size. I mean, Zion is, he'd be the biggest player in the NBA already. I mean, this kid is 19 years old. So I, I don't want to cut this podcast short, Kevin, but you decided for us to record uh, during game six of <laughs> Raptors Sixers and I, I don't know. I, 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 even now, I just I don't understand why you picked of all time. So do you want to spend like five minutes talking about the playoffs before we go watch this game? Yeah, of course. Well, I got the side stream up. Technology is a beautiful Dude, thing. Watch ESPN is a beautiful thing. Um, but yeah, so I mean, playoffs, let's, uh, you know, let's switch gears a little bit because I do. I think I think Zion and and, Ar- and Jar are the two picks are. And I like you said, I could see the trade back as well. Um, so I'll ask you because, I mean, you're you know, you're the casual fan looking at this from the outside. Um, you know, the second round has certainly lived up to the hype so far. Um, every series is still going, depending on what happens with Toronto and Philly tonight. Um, and then obviously other than Milwaukee and Boston, which is now officially closed out. Um, I'll ask you real quick about Milwaukee and Boston. You've been a known Kyrie Irving hater. Uh, did you get a little vindication there? <laughs> you know, I was, it was funny. I was sitting there. I was, I was really honed into that series because, you know, we're on the East Coast. So, I, you know, I got to pick my series. I'm not hosting the Drive and Dish podcast anymore. I don't have to stay up until midnight watching these damn uh, West Coast games. So mostly watching the East Coast games. And I got to tell you, Kyrie Irving, he was trash. He yeah. was, he was, he was bad. And I was listening to the Bill Simmons podcast and he was saying that he would drive Kyrie Irving to the airport himself. Wow, what a, that, that, see, that's delicious just because of how much smack Bill talked all year. Uh, <laughs> it was really crazy. Like just to see how quickly that devolved. Um, I'll ask you if Philly gets bounced tonight and that would mean Philly and Boston are both out, um, you know, both with massive expectations, Philly more so when they push the chips all in. Um, I don't think it would have been that way necessarily if they hadn't, but they did. Elton Brand going to get Jimmy and going to get uh, Tobias Harris. You know, which to you as an outsider do you think is more disappointing if they both lose in the second round? Celtics. That being said, uh, I think a lot of that matters for the Sixers if they are not able to keep Tobias and they aren't able to keep Jimmy. Because at the end of that, you guys gave up a lot yeah. of assets for those two guys. You yeah. Know? You have to keep at least one of them. Uh, and, uh, man, I have heard so much chatter about uh, Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid, mostly Ben Simmons just not being a good fit with Joel Embiid. And, uh, you know, I haven't watched the Sixers as closely as you have, uh, but there seems to be a lot of Ben Simmons hate right now. Well, it's it's high because, I mean, A, it's the recency bias because he was. He was really bad in Game 5. I mean, everybody in the in the, on the Sixers was bad in Game 5 other than maybe Jimmy Butler. Um, and I would. I would have liked to see him be a lot more aggressive. That was the thing is there were just stretches where you didn't even notice that he was on the floor. You know, I'd, I'd rather at that point when Embiid is clearly not 100%, I'd rather you go out driving and trying than, you know, just kind of not being able to settle for shots. Um, you know, Ben Simmons, a couple of things are going to happen. If they keep Ben Simmons at the point, He's going to either have to, A, bulk up and work on hitting free throws at a respectable clip. 
So I don't think he needs to develop a jump shot to be successful. But I think mat- getting that free throw matters. Because if he can get free throws at a consistent clip the way somebody like Giannis can, he'll be able to live off just driving and just being able to get into the driving lanes because he is faster than everybody else. He is stronger and bigger than a lot of guys in the league, and he'll be able to use his size in that regard. Um, I mean, the other two options are you play Ben as a small ball five, which I think could be extremely successful. The issue, though, with the Sixers is that you have Joel Embiid. You know, you're not really going to get a lot of minutes of Ben Sm- Ben Simmons at the five, and you're certainly not going to play him there with with Embiid on the floor. You also could use Ben Simmons as a screener, which I think has had a little bit of success, and we've seen Brett Brown go to that option and, and kind of you know run more screen options, and you know it allows Jimmy Butler to get free, and it gives Embiid a little more space. Uh, th- look, Ben Simmons is 22. Uh, he and Joel Embiid have played two full seasons together, so I just I, I don't want to. You know, this is the most talent that the Sixers have had on their roster probably in my lifetime, honestly. Um, I don't think we want to have a situation where you move on from an uber-talented prospect that quick and you just task yourself regrets. You know, in two to three years, if this isn't still working, then maybe we can have a conversation. But the reality is, is right now is we just, you have to give it more time. I know that, you know, two second-round exits in the playoffs would be quite bitter, but you have to swallow it. He's 22 years old. Like, it's just not the end of the world. We have to see, but... I also think that Ben has to put the work in this summer, too, and that matters, whether it's, you know, whether it's bulking up, whether it's getting improving the free throw line, whether it's switching hands on the jump shot. Like, you, there are flaws in the game that when you get to the, you know, top levels of the playoffs that are going to get exposed more, and, and that's going to be something they have to work on. And, but, you know, I don't think you panic trade one of these guys. Like, that's just, you can't. And I think, feel like that's an overreaction. And for the free agency thing, I think they're going to sign Butler. I'm, it depends on what Tobias Harris's market is. Because I don't know that Tobias Harris is a max player, frankly. Well, he's uh, he's only a max player. Somebody pays him max money, and somebody's probably going to pay him max money. And that's the question: is I don't know if I, to me, you know, do you resign Jimmy Butler and fill out the depth, the, the Sixers depth? Because that's the the problem with the Sixers now is they're too top heavy. If one of the starting five isn't going off, there's a real chance they'll lose that game. You know, no disrespect to no, Mike Scott, no disrespect to James Ennis, but there's just nobody else on that bench. I mean, like, there's literally no one. Boban's been unplayable this series. TJ McConnell is unplayable. Jonathan Simmons is unplayable. Jair Smith is a rookie who hasn't played all year. Um, I would like to see more of Jair Smith, but you know that's we're really nitpicking at that point. <laughs> so, so I think that the Bucks look so good right now. I, it's is it weird to you that more people aren't picking them to win the finals, like just straight up, regardless yeah. of Golden State, because yeah. they've been. Like, they remind me of 15 Golden State. They ran the gauntlet the whole season. Every advanced number checks out. Every eye test number checks out. They have a guy who's unguardable right now the way Steph was in 15 and 16. They've they've got a surrounding core who's totally locked in and knows their roles and doesn't try to do anything different. Like, you know, obviously this also changes a lot with the Kevin Durant injury. I mean, we may not even see Golden State. I still think Golden State is going to win this series. Um, You know, having that 3-2 to cushion is super helpful, but... I mean, Milwaukee, I, we need to really start talking about Milwaukee maybe winning the whole thing. They are, they are damn good. Now, if, if the Raptors pull it off against the Sixers, the one thing that really gives me pause in this is uh, Siakam on Giannis. Yeah. And I want to see that. Uh, I do too. The, the Celtics had a really hard time guarding Giannis. Obviously, they put Horford on him for a little while, and that worked in game one. Didn't really work afterwards. Um, but I think that, that Siakam is an X factor in that series, and that if he can guard Giannis and provide something offensively, uh, I do think that the Raptors have a real chance. Yeah, I mean, I picked the Raptors in seven in my bracket, and I think Toronto, you know, they have the ability to switch to where I don't think Milwaukee has that. There's always kind of kind of be that one defensive weakness on the floor. So you know, it'll be interesting. You put Lowry on Middleton, or not put, excuse me, put uh, Leonard on Middleton, you know, lock him up, make his life miserable on the perimeter. And I mean, he's a big one, too. I mean, he's Middleton was torching Boston the whole series. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really long team. Yeah, it'll be interesting. But yeah, I mean, I think if, if, you know, again, it's hard to pick against Golden State, but if even with Golden State in the mix, you know, Milwaukee, I think, would be the presumptive favorite. Even if Houston goes out and wins, you know, even with Denver still in the mix, I, I just I don't know. They're super impressive and they and they just every night they just check another box for me and it, it's starting to get I don't know. It, it feels like they could even take Golden State. I'm again, I've said all year that I've had Golden State winning and I'm not just going to jump off the bandwagon because Milwaukee beat Boston the other night. But whew, that squad can play, man. Uh, poor Paul Pierce. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, but but that's what you get for saying something stupid like that. Like, why would you ever say after any one game of any series that it's over? Unless the play, like, unless it's a situation like Kawhi two years ago in San Antonio where he just, his ankle's out and he's not going to play anymore or somebody major like that goes down. Like, what it just, you know, I was surprised as anyone the way Boston played in game one and, and they looked really impressive. But just, come on. Like, you're going to rule the best regular season team out after one game. It's just... It's silly. And when you say things like that, you set yourself up like that. Like Paul Pierce kind of deserves it right now. <laughs> it's so easy to, to make these takes, uh, even in just in your head. You know, I'll be talking to like friends about basketball and there's one game just happened. But it's what you were talking about earlier with that recency bias. And you see a, a team really uh, dominate another team. You're like, how can this other team ever you know, compete with these guys, but then you got to remember they make adjustments and yeah. teams are good. And then, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, a make or miss a league on yeah, that we, note though, Kevin, I do have to go. Yeah. We got to get out of here. I was your team right now. In the I know. No, me too. Thank you everybody uh, for listening to this episode of the driving dish NBA podcast. Check out the sun solar panel, follow Tim on Twitter, radio, Tim NBA. Uh, yeah. Recency bias is crazy. The Sixers were winning the finals after game three and we were blowing the process up after game five. It really is an incredible thing. <laughs> uh, Tim Tompkins, a pleasure as always, my friend. Uh, you know, uh, I'm excited. You know, may the ping pong balls be in your favor, I guess. That's the next time we'll talk is after that. So, yeah, we'll see. Thanks for having me on, Kevin. I appreciate it. Trying for Zion. Yeah, that doesn't work as well, but oh, well. <laughs>